All right, what's up? So, tweezers are done, Kickstarter's done. They're still for sale on the website though, if you wanna help support my bad habits. Uh, we're working on keycaps for mechanical keyboards. Very appropriate. Clearly the next step from tweezers. So that's a aluminum one. Um, I didn't have another example, but here is a piece of titanium. Pretty self-explanatory which we are now going to try the keys in. So for the last two weeks, three weeks, two and a half weeks, I've been working on these keys and the fixtures and all that kind of stuff. So I made like a cool fourth axis fixture for the keys that do cool fourth axis fixture type things in. And uh, yeah, and this is gonna be the first titanium one. So we're gonna give it a shot. I figured it was worth recording, so yeah. I'll try to catch you up where we're at. So currently for op one, I've just been roughing the material in this orange vice, little vice here. Hold on. I gotta grab my trusty ratchet. Oh, close enough. Uh, it works okay. It's like an okay vice. But it works quite good for this first stop roughing stuff I found. And the reason I'm using it is because the bigger Kurt vice that I usually use is in the way of the fixture, the fourth axis. So I don't want to bring tools near it if I can help it. So it's got these like Sarah jaws or whatever that uh, grip pretty good. They do a good job. So that's going to be our op one setup. So essentially what happens is that gets turned into this. So this is a pretty old prototype version, but that's essentially what happens here. Eventually I want to move this to the little tombstone type thing I've been using um, and basically have uh, Mighty Bites, whatever you call them, Talons I think. Are they Pipples? I don't remember. And I actually grip the stock here or something. Actually my plan for the titanium is to use round bar so that won't work. But uh, for square stock for the aluminum and stuff that works good. That way you can actually, if you need to, uh, you can tilt the fourth axis and actually uh, hit the these walls that are like not straight up and down with the side of the end mill, which is cool. Obviously you can't do all four sides, but you can do two sides. So that would be probably pretty helpful in some cases, I guess, or maybe I'm just complicating things because I like doing that. Uh, yeah, let's go over the tool path for this. It's just been a while changing over the feeds and speeds to titanium. So we'll talk about the strategy. Okay, welcome. All right, so first of all, you're going to have to excuse Fusion because it's acting very slow on this one file. So if it looks really slow, it's Fusion's fault, I swear. Uh, stock, pretty normal. I extended it out a little on the widths because it's titanium, so you don't want the cutter to see more material than it thought it was going to see because that's not good for the cutter and the titanium likes to work hard and so adding a little bit of extra width there just means the adaptive passes have a chance to actually hit the stock widths. Plus my bandsaw does not cut straight so that doesn't the stock could be like wider on one side than the other by a little bit. Um, so roughing with a 3 16 when I was doing the aluminum I had a quarter inch three flute tool which is pretty fast but I don't have a quarter inch tool that's really for titanium, so we're gonna use these 3 16 inch cutters that are bullnose actually, like there's a one thou radius on them. So they work really good. Um, yeah, so we're gonna rough with that, then we're gonna face the stock flat, whatever flat means. Then we're gonna do a pre-drill. It's really important in titanium. I have found to not uh, ramp if you can help it. It saves the corners of the tools a lot. So I always drill a lot of material out of the way. Might actually help to drill this corner too. 
But anyways, so we're gonna drill that. Then we're gonna use that drill spot for pre-drill um, plunges for adaptives. So essentially I made a point with a sketch and then I drilled that point to a certain depth and then I go into positions pre-drill and click on the point and then make sure you change your ramp type to pre-drill if you're doing a 3D adaptive. Uh, I think it's the same in 2D adaptive. Don't quote me on that. Uh, then we have a drill for the center and this is also another pre-drill because we're then going to bore it out with a 564th end mill. And so what I'm doing here is I'm boring the top wide and then the bottom is being bored not as wide because the bottom is getting thread milled and you will see why hopefully shortly. Then doing a rest adaptive with a the same tool. Uh, then we're doing this very, very, very important contour, and you'll see why, but essentially this is one of the locating features for the uh, fourth axis. So it needs to be very precise on this square because it uses a bolt through the center, and then it gets stuck on these sides, and both for location and keeping the material where it's supposed to be. So it's kind of important, so we'll measure that. Then I just have a bunch of contours to clean some things up. This contours the inner island. This just does this back area to clean up if there was a step there. And then I'm slotting. I was slotting with a 1 32nd tool before and doing two, like one pass here, one pass here. And then essentially, what's that? Eight passes? No, four passes. Um, or four contours, but I bought some 364ths, oh, I gotta change this, 364ths cutters, which are essentially the, they're a couple tenths away from the actual design thickness of the slot. So I'm gonna give these a shot, and I have some switches to check before they come off of the op one. That way we can just double check that uh, width is gonna be good. Then, after that is done, you can see now we have this cross. Um, we have this. This is a ramp, which I just said don't do, but it's quite a narrow, not narrow, not a lot of engagement up and down. I can't remember what it's called. Um, ramp, so I think it'll be okay. And yeah, I'm doing this so we clear material for up to, let's go through here. This ramp essentially cuts the front of the key down. Where is it? Oh, that's weird. It's actually way too low, so I'm glad we went over this. Oh, wait, no, because the key ramps up. Sorry. This is correct. The analysis, the key's at a slant, so it looks like it's kind of low. Helpful. Um, essentially, I'm just cutting material away from the front here, down here, enough flat. So if I want to cut through here in the op 2, which we were going to do, um, that's kind of the only way to get enough material removed is to do that contour. Because the adaptive does not completely uh, rough it out. Plus, it thinks the model is curved there, so it won't flatten that area. Uh, yeah, okay, so there's that, and then we just have our chamfers, so chamfer the inner side, a nice, just an edge break, basically. Another edge break. This trace actually goes through the center, using a center contour, so it's a chamfer, but I'm hitting both edges uh, simultaneously. Then there's an outside chamfer, and it's a little bit slower because we're leaving material on the outside because I want to finish the outside during the op two but I still want the bottom to not have a sharp edge. So essentially we're making a really big chamfer here with the intention of cleaning it up when it gets flipped for op two. Finally, we thread mill just the bottom side and I was thread milling the entire thing, but I have found that thread milling halfway down uh, makes the key come on and off the stem a lot more smooth like you would expect. And this still gives me plenty of thread for the bolts for op two and you will see what I'm talking about. So that's it for op one.
and we will now run it and be disappointed with our life choices. Not sure if this is going to work because the stock is different size from the aluminum block, but we'll see. Should be all right. I feel like I'm forgetting something. That's the 3 sixteenths cutter I was talking about. I'm a very short gauge length tool. Let me just double check that I got the X and Y in the correct orientation. Actually, you know what? It'll probably be fine. Famous last words. Oh, it sounds pretty good. Okay, so far so good. That's what we're left with. Uh, we're very close on this back side. There's some material left. So I'm hoping the op tube is able to clean that up. If not, well, we have enough, like, there's enough of a shoulder on the keys for me to actually cut into that and make it clear up without anyone noticing. So I'm not too worried. But yeah, other than that, uh, pretty good. Didn't take very long. Next is the drill. So I made sure to face the top of the part to give our drill a nice surface to drill upon as opposed to trying to drill the rough stock surface. So yeah, this is a high speed drill. Actually, I think it's a cobalt drill. And uh, yeah. With like two pecks, I think. But you probably get away without pecking, I'm not really too sure. I just find that, like, for anything deeper than a quarter inch, it seems like the titanium gets stuck in the drill flutes, but... I don't know, maybe not feeding it fast enough or something. So yeah, that's... that's it. That's a piece of aluminum. There's our hole. Always the, nice to have a hole to go into. Next is a stub eighth inch cutter with a radius, so now we're going to start doing the adaptive. So it's going to actually plunge into our pre-drilled hole, and it doesn't have the helix in, which is awesome for the cutter. And then it's just going to start roughing from there. And yeah, there's like 50 thou on the length of the cutter below the holder as far as clearance goes, which is kind of funny. moving at 42 inches a minute, which is pretty decent for this size in titanium, but probably go up a little higher, but we're just prototyping here. Looking good, looking good. on the thing we want to look at. All right, next is the center drill. I could probably do this drill after it does the outside roughing in the face, but I guess it doesn't really matter too much. This reduces a little bit of wear on the, on the drill itself because it doesn't have as deep to go.
cool. Next is the... What size cutter is it? I cannot remember. Let's see, tool six. If we look on our fancy tool list here. It's a 564. That's how I track the uh, tool numbers. So all these tool numbers match in Fusion's library, and then I just pull from this library, and then, yeah, it works. works pretty good. So this will also use that pre-drill, even though that material's been cleared out of the way. Oh, sorry, we're, we're boring right now. But when it does do the adaptive, then it will use that, but... So this is for the upper side, then it goes down there and does the lower side. Now it's going to adaptive. This might be a little fast for this cutter. 28 inches a minute. But we'll see. I've been using it all in aluminum, so it might not be very sharp anymore. Which definitely doesn't help in titanium. Okay, that went quite swell. No tool breakage. Very hip. Very cool. Alright, next is the slotting. That should be interesting. So this is a 364th cutter, 4 flute, it's a square end, and it is, what is that, 0 0.04687 is how, that's what the diameter is supposed to be, but that's what 364th says. Yay, Imperial. So yeah. I'm gonna try these speeds and speeds as a brand new cutter, and if they're incorrect, it'll probably immediately just break the cutter. But we will find out. Oh, I still hear it. Silence now, that's not a... Oh, wait, no. She's still there. Cool. We'll check it against the switch after, when it's all done. That way we can adjust all at once. Okay, now we're coming back and doing that tiny little ramp in the front I was telling you about, and I do this after because uh, we had to clear stock away from the edges, otherwise the flute, the shoulder of the tool, the shank of the tool will touch the sidewalls if we don't do that, so that's why we have to go back and do this when that material has been cleared away, if that makes any sense. That is a pretty aggressive path for the tool. It kind of bangs the edge of the tool into the sides when it changes the ramp direction. I also did hear it plunge into material, so I'll probably have to change the uh, plunge speed just to avoid chipping the corners, like I said. It is a radius cutter though, so it's nice, because uh, there's not that much of a corner to chip. Cool. 
Okay, last is a bunch of chamfering and then the thread milling, which is not very fun to watch. So I'm just going to let it run and then we will discuss or we'll check some sizes. Okay, so the thread mill survived. Very tiny. So our bolt should go through here. Cool. And it should thread here. It's a little tight on the threads. Should just hand thread pretty easy. It's pretty close, honestly. Like, you could probably get away with hand and stuff. <laughs> I think with titaniums, you can gall the titanium really easy. So, you want to be careful about what I just did. Usually, this is when you have a thing in your hand. Oh, plus there's aluminum on the uh, bolt, which is not a good practice. Let me try a different bolt. So, organization is cool. I'm using a 5 8 440 cap screw for that label. Pretty long bolt, but it's necessary because of the way the OP2 is set up. see in either this video or the next. I'm not sure. I might break this up into two parts. I have a bad habit of making one video really long. Oh, yeah, much better. Perfect. Just tight enough. Still, though, might be a little tight. I think I'm going to back out the cutter like two tenths and see if that helps. I mean, it will, but... And then, uh, yeah, we'll leave that. But you can see that big chamfer I was talking about on the edge. So when we clean up this material on the edge, we'll be left with a small chamfer. But the inside looks uh, pretty good. Good quality, which is really, really sweet. Usually uh, dull tools will leave, like, strings when it cuts the titanium, because it doesn't fully shear it when the tools are dull. But luckily there's no none of that in here. And then usually that's time, that's a good good indicator that it's time to change the tool out. But I don't see any of that, so uh, pretty good for the first titanium uh, keycap. Oh yeah, we do have to measure the inside square here. So I will do that. And we'll see if we're close. Thought I'd show you what I was talking about. This is the pad. And I got 591. Doing it with, you know, the proper hands. This is really hard to do with one hand. Um, so just believe me, it said 591 on this display here. That was a fact. And then uh, 590 is what the inner square is, and you should probably use it an actual... What's the word for it? I guess these are accurate enough for this. Um, so yeah, that just means we got to bump this out a little bit. And yeah, so we'll bump it out, and then it should fit on that pad pretty easy. Because we really only have one shot, because it's still set up. If we bump it out, and then we take it off, and then we move it over here, and then it's not big enough, well, you're going to have a really hard time relocating that to cut the feature, like, really accurately again. It's doable, but it's kind of a pain. So let's avoid that. Cool, so I just bumped out the... Uh, cutter comp a little bit and it's now perfect so that's good goes in there without any resistance and yeah so this should work perfectly all right cool i just checked it remeasured it recontoured i ended up cutting uh what was it five tenths radially so a foul all the way around i think is what that means so here is op one finished and it fits on the fixture and 
That's fantastic. So yeah, in the next video, because I decided to cut you guys out, we'll be doing the op two, which is the uh, the fun stuff. But yeah, very successful, which is good. No broken tools. Catch on the next one.